We're continuing the series, The Struggle is Real, and I'm ready to get to it. So if you don't mind, turn your Bibles to Ephesians 6, and let's stand for the reading of the Word together, and we'll see what the Lord says to us. You ready? Say, giddy up. This is the ESV, English Standard Version. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Say, His might. It's not yours, it's His. If you're going to win this thing and you flexing your muscles, it's you leaning into Him. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Your fight isn't your ex, your fight isn't your boss, your fight isn't anything in this realm. It's the invisible, the unseen, the spiritual forces. So if we're going to fight that that warfare effectively, verse 13, we need to take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness by the gospel of peace. If you want to make a note in your book, Your Bible, there's put on and there's take up. There's some action steps you have to do. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And this is a prayer that I pray that Paul prayed, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Would you pray with me? Jesus, be the teacher. Holy Spirit, speak. Challenge your people to rise up and take their positions and to win this fight through your might and your power. We lean on you. We claim to know nothing except Jesus and him crucified. And the beautiful part of that is that's all we need to know. You are all we need. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated. Well, the great news is you are in a fight for your soul and your life. That's the the most most, uh, heavy news I can give you. You're in warfare whether you want to be or not. There are three enemies you've got to deal with. The scripture talks about the flesh, talks about the world system, and then talks about Satan. Your flesh, you need to deal with yourself. And unfortunately, before we can ever take a fight fight up against the, the enemy Satan or the devil, most people don't get past the flesh. Well, how do I deal with the flesh? Simply put, the New Testament says that you need to crucify it. You need to kill that sucker. Instead of hanging around the cross, you need to get on it and die. Paul said, I die daily. That means this flesh, what it wants, you deal with it with discipline and you crucify it. That's dealing with one enemy, your carnal nature. The second is the world, the world system. The spiritual climate in our country and our culture is is at an all-time high of, uh, of a spiritual shift against the things of God. You have a polarization between all that is holy and all that is not. You have violence in the streets, and we have this absolute hostility towards anything that names the name Jesus. And this world system is trying to, if not change your mind, at least shut you up about your faith and to silence you. So how do we deal with the world system? Romans 12 says that we are not to be conformed to it. If you're going to beat the world, you're going to stand strong and go against the culture and be who God called you to be. Those are two enemies. But the third one is the one we've been dealing with mostly in the series, and that is Satan or the devil himself, who has a plan for your life just as real as God's plan for your life. His plan is to steal, kill, destroy. That's John 10 and 10. That's this side of that verse. If you get with Jesus, you get to finish the verse. But he has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Choose which which side of the comma you want to be on, folks. You can either be on the steal, kill, and destroy, or you can be on the life more abundantly. Your call. But you've got to show up 
to the fight. Your children are in the balance. Your souls are in the balance. Your marriage is in the balance. Your career is in the balance. Your mental well-being is in the balance. Everything is at stake with this conflict. He's playing for keeps. If you don't think you're in a war, you're losing. (laughs) That's all the way I know to say it. If you're not engaging in the battle, you're losing. You've got to show up. Now, the good news is the victory isn't really that dependent on you. It's more dependent on what he's done, not what you've done. But you do have to appropriate what he's done into your life and show up and take your stand. You can't lay in bed and just trust in the cross to do the work. You've got to get up and put on the armor he gave us and walk in the victory of the cross. So this is a very practical, pragmatic lesson today. This it, it might not bring a lot of shout. I don't know what it's going to bring, but it's saying you need to take up, put on, appropriate the armor of God into your life. The, the bottom line is no, in no other venue of life do people show up without the resources they need. They're going to go up in the batter's box, they're going to have a bat, and they're going to have a helmet, and they're going to go on the, the gridiron, they're going to have pads on and a helmet on. They go into a nuclear plant, they're going to have protective gear on. Soldiers go out in the battlefield with military resources. Then why is it do Christians every day get up in a spiritual battle, totally naked and empty of any resources that heaven gives? If you say, I can't win, you're calling the book a liar. If you're saying I'm defeated and I don't have a chance, you're calling the book a liar. 2 Peter 1.3 says that by his divine power, he has given us everything we need to live life of a, a life of godliness. He gives you what you need to resist temptation. He gives you what to, you need to live above depression. He gives you what you need to keep fighting. Even when the world's coming against you, you've got divine resources. You know what divine means? Not of this world. Heaven downloads it into your soul so you can fight. The armor of God, plainly put, I'm going to try to get to all of them. We'll see what happens. Number one, he says we need to put on the belt of truth and that truth determines what we take into our lives and what we eliminate from our lives. It's the belt of truth. The Roman soldier had a wide belt that covered his abdomen mainly down to his groin at times. The abdomen was very uh, a, a very target area for a, an attack. If you were wounded there, it bleeds a lot. It's susceptible to infection. And that area is what Paul says truth will need to protect. Truth will protect what we take in, what we digest, and what we eliminate. Truth will determine what we digest and what we eliminate. God knows you're in a world and in a culture that throws you. The deceit is at an all-time high right now. People are believing all kind of moral relativism, saying there's no truth, there's no absolute standard, that your truth isn't my truth, that I can do this even though you might not can. This is okay for me even though it's not okay for you. All these are deceptions. And they're buying into those. Truth is what's going to separate the men from the boys. It's going to separate those who follow Christ and those who don't. Truth. So what is, what is the question you have to ask yourself to know what truth is? Does this line up with this? Does what I'm hearing line up with God's word? Is what you're telling me lining up with God's word? Is that news broadcast or or news program lining up with God's word? Is that politician lining up with God's word? Are my friends and their opinions lining up with God's word? If they're not, then I'm not going to digest it. I'm going to eliminate that and flush it out of my system. You know you're guarded by truth when all the images and the content and the blogs of this world come at you and you're able to discern truth from error. If you can't discern error, then all of a sudden you're going to be meditating on it, thinking, and it's going to begin shaping your heart and your behaviors and your principles. A challenge for any parent is for you to have a heart-to-heart talk with your uh, elementary school, junior high, high school, and college students. If they're your kids, ask them about the biblical morality principles that are being hammered against in our world today. You're going to find that this world is trying to squeeze them into believing the, the relativism of our society instead of the absolute truth of God's word. And here's what the question is. If it doesn't line up with this, then it's got to go. 
If it doesn't line up with this, then it's going to be out of my playlist. If it doesn't line up with this, I'm not going to listen to that podcast anymore. If it doesn't line up with this, I'm going to mark that professor and his teaching as suspect. If it doesn't line up with this, I'm only going to be able to read a few pages of this textbook because it's not truth. You've got to discern truth and separate it from your life before it gets in there and causes toxic poison in your core. You following? The belt of truth. Put it on. Second thing he says to put on is a breastplate of righteousness. And this is our hearts being protected by a practical daily decision to live according to what is right before God. The reason I told you to pay attention to the words in this text, put on, take up, it means it doesn't happen automatically. You do it. Just as conscious as your decision to wear what you wore today. Just as much as you look and say, am I going to wear those shoes or those shoes? That practical of a decision is the decision to put on the armor of God in your life. You don't grab a hanger, I understand. You don't unbutton the buttons to put it on. But it's just as practical. I'll say this on this point too. I didn't say this in the last service. If you're going to win spiritual warfare, it's not a one-time event. It's a daily event. You've got to show up every day. Yes, he defeated sin in your life and he washed your sin away in a moment. That's conversion. But then you've got to walk out the salvation he gave you on the daily. And sin or, the, or Satan doesn't take a vacation. There's no days off. You've got to be on high alert daily. The breastplate covered the heart, the lungs, the vital organs. And Paul says if you're going to guard your heart, then you need righteousness. And everybody say I'm listening. Because if you're a student of the word, you know that we have a righteousness that's not our own. All of our righteousness, Isaiah said, is like filthy rags. So all of our good deeds piled up, and we can pile all, all ours together up. Still, the actual Hebrew is like menstrual rags. It's just a nastiness. God won't accept that. But when we come to the cross, we bring all of our shame, all of our regret, all of our past, all of our sin. We lay that down. He takes our sin for himself on the cross, and then he bestows upon us his righteousness. Thereby, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why I can get up here and boldly stand before you as a man of God. Not because I've been good, but because of what he's done for me. And he gave me his righteousness. It's called imputed. If you want to be an intellectual biblically today, let's talk about the word imputed. Say imputed. That means you didn't earn it. It didn't have your name on it. But when you trusted in him, he took something that was his and ascribed it to you. So now the righteousness of Jesus is Amber's. And now the righteousness of Jesus is Mark's. And every single one of us can put our name in there. We have his righteousness. Now I said all that just to flip the coin on you and tell you that's not the righteousness the breastplate is talking about. And I want you to know that because if you think that, that's the righteousness you got at salvation, then you think you put it on then and there's nothing else to do. The truth of the matter is that righteousness is a decision to live out the righteousness he gave you. It's a daily decision you're going to get up and you're going to live out what he put in you. Is that making sense? So you get up and today you say, today I'm going to live right. Today, I'm going to talk right. My language will be right. The way I treat others will be right. My meditations are going to be right. I'm going to live this day with a heart that wants to please the Lord at all costs. That's what this breastplate of righteousness is. Everybody say, I'm listening. There is no substitute for living right. There's no substitute for being obedient to Christ. You may serve in every ministry on the planet. You may give of so much money nobody else can match it. But there's no substitute for living right. In the Old Testament, Saul was bragging about how many sacrifices he gave the Lord, but he didn't obey the Lord in one other thing. And the Lord spoke to Saul and said, do I, do I want that? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Show me your salvation by how you live it. Isn't that what James said? Faith without works is dead. If you're really saved, it's going to show up. If you're really saved, you don't have to point me to the moment you got saved. Show me how you're living today. 
it's a, it's a righteousness that I can see. It's a righteous, see, the righteousness God gave us at salvation was invisible because he gave it to us in a moment. But the righteousness I live out, you see it. And others see it because I'm walking it out before men. And I believe if you put this on every day, it can become instinctive. That's what you're after. You're after a lifestyle that every day you begin leaning and bending and your proficiency and your proclivity is to do the right thing instead of struggling to do the right thing. Amen? See, if you're real carnal as a Christian, you're, you're, you want to go back to the flesh. But if you put the blessed breastplate of righteousness on every day, it can be instinctive to choose the things of Christ and choose the things of God. You want to put the breastplate on today? Get up every morning and say, I'm going to do right. My thoughts are going to be right. I'm going to treat people on the job right. I'm going to be Jesus with skin on to people. That's the breastplate of righteousness. The third thing he says, you can put shoes of the gospel of peace on. So we stand firmly because of the timeless gospel or good news of unwavering peace. See what Paul's doing? He's taking the Roman soldier's armor and he's pointing it to spiritual realities because when he was writing this, Everybody knew what the Roman armor looked like. So when he began to say, this is a breastplate, this, they saw it. And when he said, put your shoes on, they were like these sandals that allowed them to go miles in comfort. But also they had spikes on the bottom of them, almost like cleats. So that when they were in a, in a battle, their stance would be firm and they wouldn't slip. Come on, somebody. Don't you know the Lord says he will not let your foot slip or you won't stumble, but he'll pick you up with his right hand? And then they had spikes on them, so when their whole army of people was marching over the injured enemy, they would just puncture them as they stepped on them, putting the enemies under their feet. He said, so what's your shoes? The gospel or the good news of peace. Everybody say peace. Peace is not a place. Peace is not a state of mind. Peace is a person that we put on. It's Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. And by the way, every piece of armor we're putting on is the character of the person of Jesus. Jesus is truth. Jesus is righteousness. Jesus is peace. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is the Word of God we're going to take up in a minute. All we're doing is appropriating who He is to our lives. So every step I take, I take it in peace. Not conflict, not turmoil, not anxiety, not worry, not fear, not depression, but peace. I have peace with God in three ways. This isn't in your outline, but it's worth noting. The first peace I have is peace with God. If you don't live for the Lord, you're not, you're not right with God right now. There's sin in your life. You, you are not at peace with God. You're struggling with God. If you're an unbeliever, you're struggling with God. You're a sinner, and your soul is struggling with God because he's trying to pull you his way. But if you're a sinner, you're not at peace with God. You're in conflict. The carnal man is at enmity with the God, and he's struggling. But when you get saved, Romans 5.1 says, We have been justified by faith, and therefore we have peace with God. I'm no longer a sinner struggling with God. I might be a saint struggling with sin, but I'm not struggling with God. We're together. I have peace with him. And I, every step I take, I know I'm saved. Every step I take, I know he's with me. Not only do I have peace with him, though, I've got peace in God. Isaiah 26, 3, thou will keep him in perfect peace, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, which means all hell can be breaking loose around me, but I have peace in God. I am in him just like if you were to run to a storm bunker uh, away from a tornado, you're underground. The storm may be wreaking havoc above you, but you are secure and stable because you are in Christ. That's the peace that we have in him. And then the last piece is the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4 says that we shouldn't worry about all this stuff. We shouldn't be anxious for anything. But by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. And the peace of God will guard and keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you're struggling with worry, anxiety, fear, depression, you need to stop worrying about all the stuff you worry about and pray instead. Then all of a sudden, his peace will be like a soldier guarding your heart and mind. That's the peace of God keeping your heart and mind in his hands. That's why we walk in confidence because the shoes we wear are peace. 
peace. The next one, number four, he talks about shields, a shield of faith. Our faith that God will act out of his limitless power on our behalf stops every arrow of the enemy. Look at verse 16. In all circumstances. How many circumstances? All. Let's pretend this, this one's doing pretty good. Let's go over here. In how many circumstances? All. all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Now, if you've got a Captain America shield on your mind, that circular one with a star on it, you missed it. The Roman, the Roman shield was a rectangular thing that covered them from shoulder to ankle. It covered everything. If there were volleys of arrows with uh, fiery arrows thrown that were, you know, they put them in pitch and set them on fire. All that soldier had to do was this right here and lean under it and every arrow would be stopped and he would be protected under the care of the shield. It's a shield of faith. Not just a saving faith, but the faith that God is going to act on your behalf. Meaning he's going to show up. He will fight for you. He will be with you. See, the arrows come across and they say you're all alone. But faith rises up and says, nay, nay, that's not what the word says. The word says he'll never leave me or forsake me. The word told me not to fear, Isaiah 41, 10, for he's my God and he's with me and he will strengthen me and he will uphold me with his right hand. The arrows come across about your sickness saying you're always going to be sick or this is going to be the end of you. This is going to take you out. And then faith rises up, says, no, no, he is Jehovah Rophe, the Lord who heals me. By his stripes I am healed. I will live and not die. That's the shield of faith in operation. The, the, the arrows come across. Your children are never going to get saved. They're going to continue, and they're going to die in their addiction. Say, no, no. I read in the Philippian, uh, when the, he was in the Philippian jail, Paul won this jailer to the Lord. And the Lord promised him, not only will you be saved, but you and your household. See, faith has an answer for every lie of the enemy. And the breastplate, not the breastplate, but the shields have one more thing, and I'll move on. It. Did anybody watch the movie 300 by the chance? Raise your hand if you watched it. Was that not just a man flick if you've ever seen a man flick? Danette raised her hand, but she did not enjoy any of it. She just hated the whole movie. And if you don't like blood, don't watch it because it's the story of the 300 Spartans that held off Xerxes, man. And they're all chiseled up and ripped up. So if you ladies have a lust problem, you don't need to watch it either. I mean, those guys... They're not real. You need to know they painted that stuff on. That's, those aren't real abs. It's, it's movie stuff. It's Anyway. But they got in a formation when Xerxes' army was coming at them. They were, at it, they were in this uh, narrow path. And it didn't matter how many hundreds of thousands of soldiers Xerxes brought their way. They got where they were walled up between sides of Rock Mountain and they put their shields side by side by side by side and created a wall with their shields so that my shield protected the person on the left as well. It not only protected me, it protected him. And the person to my right protected me. And it created a wall of faith, if I could put it on the spiritual terms, so that when the enemy comes against me, part of my faith is also protecting you and part of your faith is protecting me. That's what's going on with this solemn assembly right now. If you're going to participate with us and you're actually going to take to heart and get on your knees and pray for our church, what we're doing is putting our shields of faith next to one another and your prayers are helping me and my prayers are helping you and we've got an impenetrable wall that the enemy cannot break through because our faith is the shield that stops everything he throws at us. And then in the movie, you'll remember, and this is true in history as well, once they got there and the commander back there said, push, then all of a sudden they all pushed forward and began to break the ranks of the enemies. The breastplate allows us to push back. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to push back on what the enemy's been trying to do in my life. Push him out of my family. Push him out of the church. Push him out of his plans for our lives. That's the shield of faith. You go down to the next one, we start talking about, is it the word of God? Nope, our minds of salvation. I'm going to fly, fly through this one right quick. The helmet of salvation covers our mind and our thoughts with the fact that Jesus is a savior. Not just of your sins, but he's a savior for your life. The God who saved you from your sins and from the guttermost and the uttermost is the God who will save you from this mess right now. 
Write down Zephaniah 317 right quick. It says, the Lord, the Lord Almighty is with you and he is mighty to save. So if you're struggling with pornography, let me tell you, God is mighty to save. If you're struggling with other addictions, he's mighty to save. If you're going through the divorce of your life and you're trying to fight for your home, he's mighty to save. If you've got cancer and you're going through chemo, he's mighty to save. That helmet is telling you the God who did this is the God who will do it again. Somebody say, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. He's faithful. If he did it here, he'll do it here. Then we get to the rhema word. This is the sword of the spirit. R-H-E-M-A. The rhema word of God is our most powerful weapon against the devil. Paul called it the sword of the spirit. It's the only thing you can sling at the enemy. Everything else is defensive armor. Little nugget, you don't have any armor on your backside. So all cowards trying to run from the enemy, you're vulnerable. Everything's offensive, you're ready to face him. But this is the weapon. The word of God is the rhema, the, the, the sword of the spirit. It was an 18-inch sword usually for the Roman soldiers, and it was sharp on both sides. It didn't matter which way you were slinging it, it was going to cut. And he says, that weapon in your hand or out of your mouth more specifically, that's why some of these songs get me excited. I don't know if it connects the dots with everybody else, but what, what does it say? When I open up my mouth, when I open up my mouth, miracles, blah, blah, all that. When we open up our mouth, what's coming out of our mouth is the sword of the Spirit. There's something real. to. Sometimes the victory is in what we say. And if we'll stop talking defeat and stop talking doubt and stop talking fear and start talking confidence in who God is and victory in our faith, then we'll see some, some things happen. So, but rhema, everybody say rhema. rhema. Different than logos. Logos, L-O-G-O-S, is the written word. Logos. Rhema, on the other hand, is a timely, applicable application of the written word to your situation by the Holy Spirit. It's when God drops something on you that you know 100% that was for you, you in this moment, at this time, in this season, for this day. That's a rhema word. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, but that's a word that'll pick you up out of the gutter. It's a word that'll pick you up out of a heaviness. It's a word that'll pick you up out of depression because it's God letting you know, I see you where you're at. I've watched your life and I'm giving you a word that says, this is not the final chapter. The page is about to turn. You're coming out. You're making it to the other side. That's a rhema word for you. A rhema is a timely spirit illuminated word to your life. That's the sword we use. If you're, in a, if you're in a fight spiritually, you want that word to sling at the devil. You don't want just some random word. You just don't, you just start, I mean, I'm not, God help me say this properly. I don't want to do your justice. I'm not saying every page on here is not powerful. It is. It is a powerful cover-to-cover -cover book. But what I'm saying is if you can get a rhema word, which is a spirit illuminated word to you, that's the one you start talking about and you start wielding in your spiritual battle. Is that making sense? Somebody ever sent you a random text? You usually don't hear from them at all. And they say, hey, just had you on my mind and wanted to send you this verse. Or I wanted to send you this four-minute devotional. And after you listen to it, you basically fell to your knees and say, my God, how did they know? They did, God help me, they didn't know. The Spirit of God put you on their mind and gave them a word for you that would be a rhema word that would let you fight today and stand today in the face of evil. God knows what you need to hear. He knows you need a word to wield that's rhema. Sometimes he'll drop it in your lap by a friend. Sometimes it'll be in a song going on the radio. You know he's with you. But let me also say, sometimes you get it from the disciplined, systematic approach to the logos. Sometimes we miss rhema because you don't have time for logos. I'm going to come over here on this one, I think. We got, there's a group of guys, man, we're going through a, a, a devotions kind of stuff together, and it's taking some time. And what I, what I keep trying to tell everybody that asks me about their time in the Word, I said, what you're trying to do, you're not trying to remember everything or understand everything. You're trying to get in a rhythm of daily encounters with the Lord. 
You're trying to fill your life with a rhythm that God knows you're meeting with him. He's meeting with you. You're opening up his word so that when you're opening up his word, it's easier for him to give you a rhema when you're looking at Logos all day. You know what I'm saying? So as you open up Logos, maybe you missed it today. That's okay. He knows tomorrow morning you're going to get up and you're going to turn to that page and right there's the Logos you need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you live on that for the rest of the day. Don't miss your time in this, looking for a word out of the air. Sometimes the word comes from your disciplined walk, saying, Lord, I don't understand at all, but I'm going to read this. And as you're reading it, something jumps off the page, and he says, I'm with you. I'm your shepherd. You're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but you're not alone. I am comforting you every step of the way. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. That's Rama. But you got to get in the logo sometimes to get the rhema download. Is this, I hope it's helping somebody. Rhema word is when God enlightens it for you. Hallelujah. Thank you for the word. What, is the word powerful? Are you kidding me right now? It is the absolute standard of truth. It is true cover to cover. There's not one doubt in my mind. It happened just like he said it would happen. You say, that's scientifically impossible. Well, you know what? I guess science is wrong if it's impossible because either science is wrong or God is greater than the science. And he flipped the science switch down just for a moment just to do a God thing. And then he flipped the science back up and said, all right, you can take over again. I walked on water. Now we can let everybody else sink. I, I stopped the sun. Now we'll keep the sun moving again. I parted the waters. All right, now I'll let the waters come back together again. Oh, God can flip the switch when he wants to. Hallelujah. That was a little download right there. God can flip the switch on your situation. He can shut it off. You say, it's impossible. God says, watch this. Flip, and all of a sudden, something miraculous happens. Now, when you walk out of it, he says, okay, back to normal we go. Nature goes again. Oh, thank you, Jesus. His word, Hebrews 4, 12 Living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's how powerful it is. His word, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my... Not Facebook. Not my friend's opinions. Not that blog. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. Joshua 1, 8, this book will not depart out of your mouth day or night. You're going to meditate in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and successful. James 1, 21, don't just be do hearers of the word, but do it. Put it into application. Rhema word is the sword. And finally, I'll try to land the plane. Got a little excited there. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a teaching. I, I had to get three minutes of preaching in there, I guess. No, but legit, that was off script. The switch, the light switch, not in my notes, didn't say it in the last service. Somebody needs to know. God can make an exception for your situation. And that though you have never, never ever seen anybody else come out of it, nobody else has ever beat it, nobody else has been restored, God can flip the switch and make, oh, he can make an exception for you. That's for somebody. Then the last thing, after I, this is putting it all together. After I put on the character of Christ, I told you it's his truth, it's his righteousness, it's faith in him, it's his word, it's his peace. After I put the character of Christ on, then Paul says, now I want you to pray in his power. The armor of God covers you with the character of Christ. Praying in the spirit fuels you with prayers with the power of Christ. Ephesians 6 and verse, um, let's see, go down here. Oh, why am I in Philippians? All right, here we go. Verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now right there, I just need, what is praying in the Spirit? If I'm going to nutshell it and make it as simple as I can, praying in the Spirit is praying with divine assistance. Get a little farther into it. Praying is a divine activity that you employ by faith. Praying in the Spirit is God praying through you. 
You're moving, you start, hey, praying, praying, normal praying is praying. That's great. Don't stop doing that. But there comes a moment at times when you're praying, normal praying, God moves on you, and all of a sudden you transition from you praying to God to God praying for you, through you, back to his Father. That's praying in the Spirit. What does that look like? Well, it can be different for a lot of people. But there's two ways to pray under the unction of the Spirit. First of all, God can come on your words and give you divine energy as you pray words that you understand in English. Just the same, I don't know how you feel the anointing of a song or a preaching or whatever, but I can tell the difference. When, I love, when somebody's praising the Lord with a song and that's good, and then all of a sudden, whew, it's like fire from heaven drops on them, and it doesn't matter what they sound like, they're feeding my soul, and they're liberating people in the room. That's singing under the anointing. Preaching can happen the same way. It happened when I started talking about flipping the switch a minute ago. There was a power that came, and I borrowed it just for a few minutes because God was speaking to somebody. When you're praying, the same thing that happens when I'm preaching on t- at times, the same thing that happens to people singing at times can happen to you while you're praying. And it's not just you praying anymore, but the fire and power of God drops on you and you begin praying under the unction of the Holy Spirit. It can be English, it can be the words you understand, but it's God praying for you. But sometimes it's praying in language you don't understand. And this is, this is where I just need to slow down just there. I got 52 seconds, which I'm not going to pay any attention to. This is where I'm thankful to be a spirit-filled Pentecostal believer. Not Pentecostal by denominational brand, but Pentecostal by biblical experience. This is when the Holy Spirit can come on you and pray for you in words you don't understand. Some of you need that as much as I do because it bypasses your intellect. It bypasses your brain. And some of you go, so that doesn't sound like it. It's a good thing that I bypass my brain. Your brain's what got you into the mess you're in. Sometimes you need to bypass what you want. Bypass your best rational thinking. (laughs) I love (laughs) y'all. You don't take offense to everything, just some of the things I say. The best way to describe it is whether you're praying about a job situation and getting a, taking a promotion or moving to Kansas for a job that's going to pay you $10,000 more, or maybe you're praying for a romantic relationship. And you know what your brain is saying. You know what your, the carnal flesh is saying. No, girl, she's fine. I won't, you know, God, you know you put her into my life. You know. You put her there. She just at the right place at the right time, right when I went by. How do you know the devil didn't put her there? (laughs) How do we know that didn't happen? Because she finishes my statements. And we just, we complete each other. You know, I could could tell you to pray about your relationship, but I know how you're going to pray. Lord, thank you for sending her into my life. Such a blessing. You're such a faithful God. Lord, lead us to as we get married, and that's the way you're going to pray. You let the Holy Spirit pray through you. He'll pray in words you don't understand and bypass all that crap you've been thinking right there. And the Holy Spirit will be telling the Father, No! Move her away to Alaska. Get her out of here, Lord. Make her hate him. May he be ugly and smelly to her. The Holy Spirit's praying God's will over your wants. Not what you want, not what you think, what God wants. Isn't that what Romans 8, 28 says? Put this on the screen. The band can come out and I'll pretend like I'm closing. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. We don't know what we ought to pray. Have you ever been at a point you've been so emotional and so distraught, you didn't know what to pray? All you had was tears coming down your face. All you had was anguish in your soul. You didn't have a clue. But the Spirit comes on you, and when we don't know what to pray, He pleads with God for us and groans that words can't express. And God, who sees into our hearts, He knows who the Spirit is and what the thought of the Spirit is because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of His people 
in accordance with his will. You never have to worry about the Spirit praying against God's will. Now, i got to worry about you praying against God's will because you think she's hot and pretty and all that. i got to worry about you praying against God's will because you want the promotion and you want the dollar signs. But always, it isn't always God giving you dollar signs. Sometimes he wants you to stay put for even a, a greater thing than what you think you want. So the Spirit prays for us when we don't know how to pray. Now, stop right here. A lot of you aren't from a Pentecostal background, so let's say, and you have been duped. You have been lied to and deceived. They say all that stuff is just for that crazy tongue-talking stuff. The service is interrupted, and somebody interprets that's what Pentecost is. It's crazy. If that's all you think the Spirit does for us, is to give us an occasional gift of the Spirit, you have missed the entire gift of the Holy Spirit to your life. He didn't come to interrupt the church service occasionally. He came to empower your life on the daily. He came to pray for you in the privacy of your home, in your car, in your bedroom. And when you don't know what to do, it's not for anybody else. Jude 20 said, I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost and build up my faith. And he prays for me when it's just me. Oh, don't you know, sometimes it's just you and him. And he prays for you. That's praying in the Spirit. Now watch how awesome this is. I'll close up here, I think. Here's, go back to verse 26. Verse 26, I want you to look at the words no. In the same way, he helps us pray, weak as we are, for we do not know. Do y'all see that? We don't know. How many want to be honest? You don't know how to pray. So raise your hand, I don't know. The Spirit himself, okay, go to verse 27. But God who sees into our hearts, he knows. So I don't know, but he knows. You see that? And he knows how to pray, and he's going to pray in accordance with his will. So I started, I don't know. But God knows, and he prays for me according to his will. Now watch verse 28. And now I know that all things work together for good. Do you see what the power of the Holy Spirit is in your life? You start off not knowing. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to turn. God says, hold on, I got this, if you will. Flip a switch, and he comes and allows me to pray in a way I know, no, I know, wouldn't know how to pray without him because God knows how to pray. I don't know. He knows. But after he prays through me, now I walk out of my prayer closet and say, now I know. What do I know? That all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose. That's the power of prayer. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that the message was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. If it was, we'd just like to take a few more seconds of your time and ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you don't mind, there's a digital connection card that you could submit and, and, and send our way, and it'll let us stay connected to you more personally. First, it'll let, you, let us know who you are. Second, how frequent, frequently you tune in. And also, there's a place for prayer requests, and we would love to partner with you and pray about what's going on in your life. The second thing that would be great is if you could just take a moment, click a link, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay connected with what's going on at The Point every week. And also, man, if this was a blessing to you today, it might be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody in your friend group or in your network of influence. So why don't you just share this video and pray that God uses it to encourage them as well. Finally, if uh, you'd like to consider blessing this ministry financially, there's a giving link at the bottom. You can click down there and that'll help us continue to throw out videos like this that could be a life changer for somebody out there. So guys, thank you again for joining us. We're so blessed that you did. We're so honored to have you as a part of our online family. And we want you to know one more thing. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next time.